All right, good morning again, church family. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14. We're going to continue in Mark. The title of the message today is The the Lamb to be Slain. The Lamb to be Slain. We're going to be in verses 12 through 16. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. And we're going to continue through chapter 14, um, which Mark uses to show the the buildup of the betrayal of Christ. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. Once you've found the passage, if you would stand with me in honor of the one who gave us this word as we read our text this morning together. Beginning in verse 12, it reads, And on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to come to you and gather uh, as a body in worship, um, to come to you on, on your Lord's Day um, and, and give you glory. I pray that each of us have come with hearts that are ready to worship in spirit and in truth and to be fed from your word um, like only you can do. We pray, Lord, that you will impact us with the text that we have today, that we can see the glory of Christ um, throughout redemptive history uh, today. And I pray, Lord, for myself that you would remove any distractions, any hindrances, um, any any chasing thoughts or, or whatever the case may be. Lord, keep my tongue from getting tied, that you would be glorified and your word would be communicated uh, as you have decreed. We love you and thank you for all that you've done for us, for your grace that pours out, for Christ's sacrifice, and I pray that we would do all that we do for your glory. In your holy name I pray, amen. All right, you can be seated. So over the last, um, or last week specifically, we got into chapter 14, um, and we saw the sacrifice of faith, um, and the motivation that comes from the changed heart of a disciple to reveal the preeminence of Christ. We, we saw the woman come in, um, and, and pour the nard over Jesus, preparing him for his burial as an act of faith. Um, and now we're going to see um, a, a task that has to be completed before the, the narrative can be moved forward. Um, the disciples are going to go prepare a place for them to take Passover together. Um, and as we see the development of chapter 14 continue, we're going to continue to see Passion Week develop, as many of us are familiar, if, if you've been around the church for any period of time. Um, often celebrated around the Easter uh, week. Um, But here as we're going through this, we're going to see Mark continue to develop um, this idea of Christ's betrayal and what ultimately becomes his death for those who are his. Um, Now, today's sermon will differ just a little bit from others that we've had in Mark. We're going to read just the beginning of verse 12 here in just a moment, and then we're going to go back to Exodus, and we're going to really wrap our minds around Passover. What what was Passover? Why is it so significant that they took Passover together? And by God's grace, we will see the connection between the Lamb of Passover and the Lamb um, of uh, who is Jesus Christ. And so we want to make that connection solid because over the next couple of weeks, we're going to continue to see these connections of Jesus as the Passover Lamb throughout his um, rest of chapter 14, as well as him Um, giving himself as the sacrificial lamb. So there's a lot of connections that I want to make sure we really wrap our minds around. Um, And so we're going to dig in here in just a moment for that, because ultimately our goal of going through this last section of Mark is to see God's redemptive plan climaxed. Um, And in order to see the climax and to appreciate it and to revel in the beauty of what Christ is doing, we have to understand um, what has happened in human history, how God has reached down Um, throughout different times in history to bring about his redemption. Um, We're going to see Christ as the substance, the anti-type of the shadows of the Old Testament um, in a few different ways. Um, And really, ultimately, what we want to do is revel in the sovereignty of God. 
um, because ultimately the sovereignty of God um, is what is put on display for the disciples and for us to see as the king of the universe uh, reaches down to save his people. And so it's a beautiful picture that I hope is painted for you as we look at the, the redemptive history of God's plan to save his people. So number one, let's dig in. Number one, Passover's purpose. If you're a note taker, Passover's purpose. Um, verse 12a is all we're going to read um, in light of that. And then we're going to jump into some Old Testament text. If you're a note taker, be ready. We're going to write down several um, and we're going to flip back there together. Um, if you don't have a Bible or forgot your Bible, we do now have extra Bibles over on the table. So if you need one, feel free to grab one. So Mark chapter 14, verse 12, it says, On the first day of unleavened, unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed. So the day of unleavened bread and the Passover, what does that mean? What is the feast of unleavened bread? Um, it's the first day of this festival. Mark notates it's the first day. It's likely here on Thursday um, at, at this particular time, and we'll, we'll notate more about this in a moment. But at this particular time, it was acceptable for the Jews to start sacrificing the Passover lamb earlier in the day. Originally, it was set down to be done at twilight or as dark was setting in. Um, but it's very likely that it was in the morning, um, early morning, because whenever you're sacrificing over 250,000 lambs at one time in one place, um, they couldn't get it all done at dark, right? Dark only lasts so long. Um, and so it's very likely that this is on Thursday, um, sometime probably around the lunch hour, a little bit before, because they had to start their day to get everything done in preparation for the darkness to come uh, when Passover would actually begin. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover to a Jew is often thought of as basically one and the same thing. Um, they, would, they would refer to the Feast of Unleavened Bread as the seven-day festival. Um, past, sometimes they would call it Passover. Sometimes they would use Passover to reference specifically just the lamb or the slaughtering of the lamb. Um, and so these really ought to be thought about as the one and, and the same festival. And this was a time that was set down centuries before um, Mark chapter 14 was written or Jesus was walking the earth. And so I want us to go back and take a look at that. I want us to understand what is Passover? Why is it so significant? What is the idea of the unleavened bread? So if you would, begin by turning to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And while you're turning there, I want to give us just a quick recap of where we're going to be in Exodus. Um, Exodus chapter 12 um, is coming at a time um, whenever the Israelites had been in Egypt for some 400 years. They were slaves. Um, they had grown and multiplied in, in, um, in the, the size of their nation. So their people were growing. They were having lots of children and, and continuing to grow. And God was blessing them in that way. But they were still ultimately in slavery. And Moses was being sent as the mediator, the one who would come and, and be used by God to deliver them from slavery, to deliver them from their hardship that they were stuck in, that they were slaves and couldn't free themselves from. And so chapter 12 picks up at the last of the 10 plagues. Um, God ultimately used 10 plagues to free his people from Egypt. The first nine have already occurred. We're not going to go into those today. But we do want to take a look at the 10th one. Um, the 10th one is the plague of the death of the firstborn, uh, both beast and man, in all of the land of Egypt. And so we're now at the 10th and final plague that God is going to use to free his people. And we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 through 28. I know normally we don't read that much uh, of a different passage, but I want us to get a full rounded view of the command of what Passover should be and why it should be there. So Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 28. It reads, Now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to, you are to apportion the lamb. Your lamb shall be a male, Without blemish, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. 
then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall, sh shall slaughter it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with fire, and they, sh they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its heads and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning. But whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahweh. And I will go to the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood and I will pass over you. And there shall be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh. Throughout your generations, you, to, you are to celebrate it as a perpetual statute. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be done by you. You shall also keep the feast of unleavened, unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought you out of the house of, excuse me, out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall keep this day throughout your generations as a perpetual statute. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats what is unleavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened, in all your places of habitation you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Bring out and take for yourselves lambs according to your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and touch some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the doorway of his house until morning. And Yahweh will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and he will see the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. And Yahweh will pass over the doorway and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall keep this event as a statute for you and your children forever. And it will be when you enter the land which Yahweh will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this new slavery. And it will be when your children say to you, what is the meaning of this new slavery to you? That you shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to Yahweh who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but delivered our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. And the sons of Israel went and did so, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. So I know that was rather lengthy, but I want us to understand and see multiple times God repeated what to do, told them multiple times, told Moses several times that it should be a statute throughout their generations. And there are very specific things in this that we have to pick up and draw out and understand their connection to Christ. So the instructions for Passover continue on the rest of chapter 12 of Exodus and on into chapter 13 as well. And we're going to look at a little bit of chapter 13 in a minute. But if you want to see more about it, more details of how they executed it, please feel free to do that. I would encourage you to do that. But this is a, a type of uh, two different types of genre whenever we're looking at this particular explanation. So we often see this in, in our first default is that it's a narrative. It's a story. Right? We're understanding it as a story of Moses telling us what happened. But there's more in it than that because there's specific instructions as well. So sometimes when you read scripture and you're interpreting it, you have to understand the genres that are there. So this is a story and instruction, and it's perfectly interwoven and complementary. So there's, there's multiple things here we have to understand um, of what God is telling them. And so for the Israelites, this plague, and imagine the Israelites' place right now. They're in slavery. They've been crying out for God's help. God sent Moses. There's been multiple plagues. God has protected them from the plague so far. Um, if you recall, the, the majority of the plagues were to Egypt only, and it would, it would notate there. The writer would notate, um, and nothing occurred to the Israelites. And now, 
this plague of judgment and wrath and death to show the Egyptian gods who really is God is now coming. And in order for God to bring this about, he has to deliver his people from his own judgment. I hope that's making a connection for you. He has to deliver his people from his own judgment, and he provides them a way to do that. So God has gives specific instructions in order for his people, the ones he has chosen, the ones he has brought to where they are and has chosen to save from the slavery that they are in, he gives very specific instructions to be followed. And some key things to note here about the context of how this particular Passover rule or the, the statute was set down is that this is in the context of the family. At this time, the Passover was initially laid down as being the father, the head of the household, would be the one responsible for following the instructions of Yahweh, of what he had instructed them to do. And they would take it as a, as a family, as a remembrance for the father to be able to teach his children about God delivering them into a new slavery. And I hope that makes a connection for you as well. So God delivers them from slavery to Egypt, and simply they have a new slavery. And this is in the context of the home. And that God has specific commands to be fulfilled to avoid death and judgment. But there's, there's something that has to be done in order for death and judgment to not come upon the people of God. So there's a way for it to be avoided. But the, the point that has to be, or what has to be done, the instructions that have to be followed, blood has to be spilled in order for the judgment to pass over them. Blood must be shed. And it's from a very specific type of animal. It's from a perfect lamb less than a year old. A perfect lamb less than a year old, the blood has to be shed. And these instructions were handed down to Israel, to the people of God, by a mediator, Moses. God did not reach down to the people themselves. He used a mediator to give these instructions to to show them that blood had to be shed to avoid death and judgment that was coming. And then they were to consume the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, of course, going for a full seven days of not eating leavened items, um, completely unleavened bread for, for seven days, and then along with the bitter herbs. So they're very specific instructions that were given to the nation of Israel. And so they were to slaughter it at twilight on the 14th day of Nisan, um, in the days that they were in Egypt, it was called Abib. So some of your translations may say in the month of Abib. That's what it was originally called. Later on, the Jews changed that month's name to Nisan, N-I-S-A-N. But it was on the 14th day of Nisan. And on a Jewish calendar, a new day started at dark of the previous day. So in our minds, the new day starts at midnight, right? So today is the, the what, 10th, 13th. Today is the 13th, so the 14th starts tonight at midnight. Well, for the Jews, technically tomorrow would start when the sun went down. Um, and so it actually started a little bit earlier than what our Western minds are used to. And so they would actually slaughter the animal at twilight just before dark because Passover began at dark, and that would be considered the 15th day of Nisan, and they would observe Passover till dark of the following day. And so these are the very specific instructions, and you can't get more vivid in, in intrinsic, specific instructions than what God gave Moses to tell the children. And the purpose of this was not just to put blood around the doorposts and the lintel, so to put blood above the door and on both sides of the door. That was the initial purpose, but there's a more specific purpose, a broader purpose that God initiated this plan. And it was to remind his people, remind his people for generations to come that he is their God. He is the one that delivered them from the slavery that they could not deliver themselves from. That he is the one that kept death from entering their homes. That he is the one that stopped the judgment. He provided the way for the judgment to be stopped and to not impact his people, and that he delivered them from death and judgment. And so this, this idea of memory and taking it forward is extremely important to understand when we think about the Passover that Jesus is about to have with his disciples, at which time he starts the Lord's Supper. That's a little tidbit, a little taste, a little teaser of the, whenever we preach through the Passover, I mean, excuse me, the Lord's Supper, the connection of reminding ourselves what God has done. 
He set this down for a very specific purpose. And so when we move on in Exodus, look at me, well, look at with me, if you will, Exodus chapter 13. So it shouldn't be too much farther for you. The next chapter over. We're going to begin in chapter 1 here. And we're going to read a little bit more about the actual um, festival of unleavened bread. Because Jesus is going to participate in that. That's the plan. Uh, ultimately, he's betrayed before they can get through the full seven days. But this is what was laid down for them as far as the festival itself goes. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 16. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify me, sanctify to me every firstborn, the first, uh, first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to me. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery, for by a strong hand Yahweh brought you out from this place. And nothing leavened shall be eaten. This day in the month of Abib you are going out. And it shall be when Yahweh brings you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall do this service in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. And you shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be as a sign to you on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand Yahweh brought you out of Egypt. Therefore you shall keep this statue at its appointed time from year to year, and it will be when Yahweh brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and gives it to you. And you shall devote to Yahweh the first offspring of every womb, and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to Yahweh. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your, your sons you shall redeem. And it will be when your sons ask you in time coming, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a strong hand Yahweh brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it happened when Pharaoh hardened his heart with stiffness about letting us go, that Yahweh killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to Yahweh the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So, so it will be as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries between your eyes, for with a strong hand Yahweh brought us out of Egypt. So the whole point of this festival, the entire idea is God's redemption and remembering it. The entire thing is about God redeeming his people out of slavery. And this festival was to ensure that his people, regardless of where they go, when they get delivered to the promised land, while they're traveling to the promised land, everything in between and for generations to come, they would be reminded that God redeemed them from slavery by the might of his hand that he is mighty to save his people. So to the Jew, the idea of Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread are meant to remind them of what God did for them in the Exodus. So we see several things from the Exodus explanation of the Passover. We see the connection of the lamb that was slain, the perfect lamb, the blood that had to be shed by God's own solution to his judgment and wrath. He provided the solution. He provided what was needed through a mediator. And he reminds them over and over and over again that he is the one. Every year for an entire week, they are to be reminded that he is the one that delivered them from the slavery that they could not deliver themselves from. But that's not all that Passover marks. Turn with me, if you will, to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. So we've seen the initial delivery from slavery. So God's people are redeemed. They're delivered. Um, the, the idea of redemption um, of their sons, delivering redemption, uh, freedom from slavery, all those things are tightly interwoven throughout um, the Passover instructions. But now we're going to see in Joshua that Passover marked something else extremely significant that we cannot miss. Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Let me read that for us. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. 
And the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal and celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. And on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the yield of the land, unleavened cakes and roasted grain. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the produce of the land of Canaan during that year. So this particular passage comes in context of the story. As many of you may know, the, 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 the defeat of Jericho, this is after the spies went to Rahab, but before the destruction, destruction of Jericho. So if you recall, Joshua had sent spies to Jericho. Um, Rahab hid them. They came back, reported, um, and the Israelites uh, under Joshua's leadership said, okay, we're going to cross um, the Jordan. And they pulled out 12 stones, marked their crossing of the Jordan as remembrance to their kids of, of God's delivering them in from slavery and into the promised land. And in so doing, they celebrated Passover. Um, it's no coincidence that God had them cross over the Jordan in relation to Passover. Why is that? Because as you can see, God's provision for them ceased the day that they entered the land of promise, the day that they were delivered into the promised land. Now, think at a higher level with me. If Passover marks the beginning of his people being delivered from slavery, and then also marks the time that they're delivered into after being sustained through all that they went through, all their rebellion in the wilderness, the 40 years, the manna being provided, everything that God put up with to redeem them and still be their God and them still be his people has now delivered them to the promised land. Where, as it says at the beginning of our passage there, he has rolled away the reproach of Egypt from them. The reproach of slavery is no longer considered to be a part of who they are. In other words, he delivered them from slavery with Passover and he delivered them to the new land, the new promised land with Passover. So it bookends delivery from slavery and making it to the promised land. And think about that from our perspective and what we know about the New Testament. God delivers us from sin, from slavery, from death, from judgment, by a Christ's blood, the Lamb, and then he delivers us, washing away completely any reproach of our former slavery upon entering into glory or our promised land. So the Passover marks the exact path of the nation of Israel as a shadow, as a type of what we as believers, the people of God, will see in our own redemption. God was teaching us so much in the exodus of the nation of Israel. It's a beautiful thing to see as we see that bookend for the nation of Israel and we think about it in applying to our own lives. Because ultimately for us, Jesus, the Christ, the lamb to be slain, delivers his people. His blood was shed to redeem his people from their slavery and death. He provides for us throughout our sojourning in a land that isn't ours as we travel through the wilderness. And he provides for us daily just as he provided for Israel the manna. And he promises to deliver us to our own promised land where we will sup with him again in his kingdom. The connections are beautiful. Now, there's a slight change in the Passover that I want us to understand as well, because God develops the Passover to have even more emphasis and understanding in preparation for Christ's coming. So remember, Passover and all these things that God is implementing for Israel was not for the sake of Israel alone. It was in a way of pointing towards the coming Redeemer, as so that we would know who the Redeemer is, and we would know when the Redeemer came, and we would know what his actions meant. And so turn with me, if you will, now to Deuteronomy chapter 16. So, so far we've seen the Passover, how it was initiated, the Passover, how God used it to deliver his people in the, in the promised land and to mark that, and how it was a constant reminder of his deliverance from their slavery so that they would stay focused on him and understand his might and understand his power and understand their new slavery to him. And now in Deuteronomy 16, verses 1 through 8, he makes a few small changes as he establishes them on a national level. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. It reads, Keep the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover to Yahweh your God. 
For in the month of Abib, Yahweh your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall sacrifice the Passover to Yahweh your God from the flock and the herd and the place where Yahweh chooses for his name to dwell. You shall not eat unleavened, excuse me, you shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so that you remember that you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. For seven days no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory, and none of the flesh which you sacrifice on the evening of the first day shall remain overnight until morning. You are not allowed to sacrifice the Passover in any of your gates of the towns which Yahweh your God is giving you, but in the place where Yahweh your God chooses for his name to dwell, there you shall sacrifice the Passover in the evening at sunset, at the appointed time that you came out of Egypt, and you shall cook and eat it in the place which Yahweh your God chooses. In the morning you are to return to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to Yahweh your God. You shall do, you shall do no work on it. So there's a few key things that have changed here. Primarily, Passover is now centralized to the place where Yahweh your God chooses for his name to dwell. In other words, where his glory will be. This is now going to be the tabernacle only or ultimately the temple. Now we have seen through Mark, Jesus reveal himself as the one in whom the glory of God dwells, haven't we? The Mount of Transfiguration is our primary one, but understanding that by God shifting the focus to where he chooses to dwell, he is making another point to the shadow, another shadow, an allusion to the Redeemer coming. Because it is, in, it is in Christ that he chooses to reveal his glory. It is in Christ that he chooses to come and dwell among men. It is in Christ the Redeemer that he is sacrificing this lamb to save his people. Do you see, are you beginning to see the connections that Passover has? A couple of other things that they changed here, which are not significant necessarily to pointing to Christ specifically, but there was a, a time to be, uh, there was a, Allowed the slaughter was allowed to be earlier in the day, and that allowed pilgrims to travel because God is now moving it where they can't do it in their own homes. They have to do it where he chooses to dwell. In other words, he would have to do it now in Jerusalem. So he allowed it to be done earlier in the day. Um, it also allowed now for sheep or cattle to be used for the sacrifice, so you could pick either one. Um, the method of cooking was changed from roasting to broiling. Um, but the most important and significant change is that it was brought to the national level. It was brought to the, the national level of the people of Israel, Israel and themselves. And we know Christ is called the true Son of God, the true Israel, redeeming his people as the head of the body, the head of the chosen ones, the head of the elect whom God would save. For the sake of time, I, I couldn't go into any further detail on the Passover, tracing it throughout the Old Testament, but if you would like to do so on your own, I'll give you these texts. You can continue to see further Passover development in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, and 2 Chronicles chapter 35, 1 through 19. So if you'd like to take time to do that, um, it's, it's where God uses the Passover to refocus his people on himself through some of the kings. But ultimately, what I want us to understand here is the sovereignty of God in bringing all these things about. He specifically and in high detail-oriented fashion gave these very specific and to us Western and our Western minds odd things to do, right? Very odd things. Dip a branch of hyssop into blood and wipe it on your door to be redeemed, to be taken out of your slavery, to ultimately have the victory and avoid the wrath and judgment of God. And yet, he did that so that the mystery, as Paul calls the mystery of the Christ being shown throughout the Old Testament, that we could look at Christ once he's come and done what he's going to do, we would know who he was. It would be a way for him to reveal to us who God is. So let's make a few connections to Christ. Let's make a few connections and elaborate just briefly, and we're going to elaborate more on these going. I'm just going to touch on them now, because over the next two weeks, as we dig into the Lord's Supper, um, and those kinds of things, we're, we're going to see more of these connections play out. But first, Jesus is called by John the Baptist, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world in John 1.29. So right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he is called the lamb. 
This coincides perfectly with the lamb of Passover, which was slaughtered to protect from death. And it's what God implemented and used to protect his people from his own judgment. What he said would happen for them to be delivered from it, he had to provide the way. And he did by providing a lamb to be slain, just as he provided Christ to be slain for his own people. A second connection that we must see is Moses delivered the instructions for Passover as the mediator of God, just as Jesus is called the mediator for his people, 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So God delivered his redemptive plan for the nation of Israel through a mediator, just as he sent his son to be the mediator and the bridge, if you will, between God and man. Another connection that we can make is there were requirements by God for Israel to be delivered. Specific instructions, specific things that had to be met. Things that the nation of Israel could not provide for themselves without his specific intervention and instruction to do so. I don't think anyone would have painted blood on the doorposts of their doors to try to save themselves. That's, that's not something man can come up with. In other words, it was something man could not do for himself, but God provided the instructions and provided the way to deliver, them, to deliver his people from his own wrath and judgment for their sins, just as he does for us. God requires specific things for our relationship to him to be reconciled. He requires absolute perfection for our relationship to him to be reconciled. And when we could not do that for ourselves, he sent Christ with the specific instruction and mission because he is the resurrection and life. And that whoever believes in him shall not, though he die, he shall live. John eleven twenty five. 25. Let me reread that again. I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So God not only provided the provision for the nation of Israel to avoid the wrath and his judgment to come, to avoid death and to be free from slavery, he provides Christ as the mediator to bring those same deliverances through himself for his people in the New Testament church. And I hope this connection is one that's already been made in your mind, but let's go ahead and make it together. The blood of the lamb had to be spilled to mark the people of God. In the nation of Israel, the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, had to be spilled. It had to be shed. The animal would lose its life in order for them to be identified as God's people so that his wrath and judgment would pass over them. And it is by Christ's blood, the lamb of God, that we are saved. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, justified by his blood. Romans 5, 9. Another connection, and I made it a moment ago, but the Passover after Deuteronomy could only be celebrated where the glory of God dwelt. And in Jesus, we see the fullest revelation of where the glory of God resides. He is now the access to God. Another connection that we will elaborate more on next over the next two weeks is that Passover was used to remind the people of God of their delivery from slavery. Generation after generation, every year, they took a, a week to be reminded that they are gods and they are slaves to him because of what he provided for them and delivering them from death, slavery, and judgment. And the Lord's Supper, which will be instituted during the Passover celebration by Christ, is designed to remind the people of God in the church of what Christ, the Passover lamb, to deliver, did to deliver them from slavery and death and judgment. So he gave us a very similar reminder that we are to observe per a later epistle every time we come together. And the last one, the Passover was used by God to book in the delivery of his people from slavery and their delivery to the promised land. And Jesus, the lamb who was sacrificed to mark the redemption of his people, will ultimately be the one that comes to get us to deliver us to the promised land where we'd be free from the stain and reproach of our former slavery and to the fullest extent. And we will sup with him again, just as he promised that we would do. So I hope these connections give you the chills that they gave me this week. The beauty of seeing God's sovereignty throughout 
the Old Testament, the, the types and shadows that he put in place so that we would one day understand who Christ is. I hope this deepens the view of what Christ has done and the beauty of what God has done to redeem his people. Because yes, the Passover was initially handed to the nation of Israel, but there was a second and higher purpose for it. And that was for ultimately the redemption of his people through Christ. So now that we've went back and looked at these shadows and these types pointing forward to Christ, let's come back to Mark. So if you would turn back to Mark chapter 14. I told you it'd feel a little bit different than our normal sermons, but I thought it very important to take a moment and understand what Passover was so we could understand what Mark is saying and what Christ is doing. So point number two, Passover is preparation. Don't worry, I only have six points today. No, I'm kidding. This is, this is the last one. Point number two, Passover is preparation. Verses 13, or excuse me, 12b through 16. So I'm just going to pick back up and read these last couple of verses here of our text. His disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. So at this point, they're in Jerusalem. They're in crowded Jerusalem. We're about to go to crowded Jerusalem. Excuse me. They're still likely in Bethany when he sends the disciples on ahead. But the importance of them celebrating Passover can't be missed. Christ was submitting to the instructions that God had given in the Old Testament that we just reviewed. And so with the high number of people flooding into Jerusalem, it was time to go reserve their space. It was common practice for the people in Jerusalem to have prepared any extra space that they could provide. So every, every person who dwelt within the walls of Jerusalem, because you could only come to Jerusalem and celebrate Passover there, and every Jew who was a committed Jew would celebrate Passover every year. So we're seeing an influx of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Josephus records that when Passover was, um, was celebrated in AD 66, with the completion of the temple, there were over 255,000 lambs slaughtered for that year's Passover. The average lamb feeds 10 people. And so if they're following the instructions to only kill a lamb that feeds enough people in your household, and you extrapolate that out, 255,000 at 10 people, that's a lot of people. And I think the guess is probably a little bit high, and some people probably didn't provide a lamb just for the size of 10 people. But the, the picture here is there were a lot of people crammed into Jerusalem for the Passovers. And so the disciples look to Christ and they say, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? It's very significant that they are asking his opinion and calling it him eating the Passover or referencing him. They didn't say us, it's in the singular. For you to eat the Passover. They are acknowledging his authority and his direction in their group being seen as a family coming to take Passover together in Jerusalem. And so Jesus sends two of his disciples to prepare the space. We know from Luke, it was uh, Luke 22, verse 8, it was Peter and John that he sent. Mark doesn't record the names. He simply says two of the disciples go. But here we're seeing Mark bookending this next phase of what Jesus has come to do. And if you recall back in Mark chapter 11, at the beginning of his entrance into Jerusalem, this passage and that passage sounds very, very similar. In fact, there's 11 words or phrases in the Mark chapter 11 on the entrance to Jerusalem and Mark chapter 14 for the Passover preparation. There are 11 words and phrases that match almost perfectly. And so we have Jesus now sending two of his disciples to prepare for the next phase of his mission. He came to Jerusalem with the same mentality. He's now sending his disciples to prepare for the next phase, which is his sacrifice. So you see him in complete and utter control. No one forcing him to do this. He is coming to lay down his life as the Passover lamb in complete submission to the Father's will and decree. So the disciples go into the city to look for a man carrying a pitcher. Um, they, they think that he's probably near the, um, the pool of Siloam uh, on the one side of Jerusalem because that's where the majority of people would get water in a, in a, when the city was that busy. 
And imagine the millions of people that are crowding the streets. We've already talked about how many people were there. And the disciples were to look for one man carrying a pitcher of water. Obviously, we see Christ's guidance here through the Spirit for them to find the right man because they did ultimately find the right man and followed him to his house. And the, the disciples were to go into the owner of the house and say, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? What an extraordinary way for the disciples to begin that conversation. The teacher says. The teacher says. If someone walked into my house and said, the teacher says, I would take my wife because we homeschool, but beyond that, I wouldn't have any reference to think who the teacher was. And yet, by God, by God in his sovereignty, has Jesus displaying his authoritative sovereign control as he gives us disciples specific details and every minute detail, regardless of how odd it sounded to them, was fulfilled in its entirety, including the furnishing of the rooms. So the owner there took them up to the guest room showed him a large upper room, furnished and ready. Now, in our minds, we think furnished and ready being full of furniture, right? So if you think of a furnished house for rent or to purchase, you think of all the furniture being there. Furnished in the, that original language does not mean furniture. Um, it actually holds the idea of being ready for dinner. Um, there's, there's, in those days, whenever they would prepare for Passover, they would simply roll out rugs. They would move everything out of the room to provide as much space as possible, and they would roll out rugs. And you know those round pillows that you could kind of lean on, that's what they would set up. So to be furnished meant that they were prepared for a meal for a large group of people. That was, that was the context of that original word in the Greek. It's not furnished with furniture like we would think, but it's already ready to go for the meal. And so at this point, the fulfillment of Christ's mission is moving ever forward. And so at this point, there's, there's nothing that can oppose him there's, there's nothing that can act, they, they can, people can act against him, but there's no one that can truly oppose him. Because he is in sovereign control down to the minute detail of which man carrying a pitcher of water was to be followed for his disciples to complete their mission. I want to emphasize the sovereignty of Christ and the decree of our Lord. Because the chief priests, as we saw last week, were already planning to stop him. Judas was already setting up a, a a chance to betray him. He knows of his impending death. He knows it's coming. He's already predicted it and applauded a woman for preparing him for burial, and yet he marches forward to the will of his father with sovereign authority and in complete control. The Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb that was provided for us, is preparing to redeem his people with an absolute focus. Nothing can oppose him. Nothing can stop him. They can try to stand against him, and ultimately that too will be used in God's plan to redeem his people. I found a quote here this week I'd like to read to you in reference to this passage. I thought it very appropriate. The careful and deliberate preparations for the Passover are a clue that in this foundational event, Jesus sees the proper context for his own self-revelation. The sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb, that's Passover Lamb, will both interpret and be fulfilled in his impending death that will inaugurate a new covenant in his own blood poured out for many. There's a reason Christ went there at Passover. There's a reason he took his people there and instructed his disciples to prepare his way. There's a reason he went there being the one who came as God's greatest revelation to humankind, the one who carries his glory. Everything that we saw in the Old Testament, Jesus intentionally used here to reveal exactly who he is and exactly what he's here to do. And by the Spirit's, by God's grace and the Spirit's work in us, we too can understand and see that revealed. Now to apply this to ourselves, I want us, as I'm sure you probably already guessed, at least I hope you have, I want us to, to drill in and understand and, and rely on God's sovereignty. Because for God to accomplish the connections that he does across centuries of time is evidence of his sovereignty throughout redemptive history. 
He gave the mystery of the Redeemer and the types and shadows long before the Messiah was on the earth. Things that can only be seen when viewed through the lens of Christ. You only see those things in the Old Testament revealed when you look back through the lens of Christ. And so we see Christ being the pinnacle of redemptive history, the climax of God's plan to save his people, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who sets us free from our slavery and will ultimately deliver us as the Passover lamb to the promised land. He is the glory of God present on earth, and he is the sovereign king who gave up his throne of praise to come put on flesh to redeem his people. But I want to emphasize that sovereignty one more time because we have to trust in him. We have to trust in him. Life is hard. This world is falling apart. And yet Christ is in control. If he is in control over that many centuries and can make that minute detail of information point to him, he can control the things that are going on around us. And he proves that to us and reveals that to us as a reminder, just like he did for Israel, to remind them, he reminds us through these things and through the weekly supper that we have the privilege of taking, that he is in control because we need the reminder over and over and over again. And so this, I hope, brings you to a point of reveling in him and worshiping him at a deeper level, level, level than you ever have before at a deeper level than what's ever been imagined for you. Because when you see those connections as a follower of Christ, as someone who's been redeemed by him, and you see those connections and you see what God sovereignly did reaching down in human history over and over and over again to ultimately save his people, which means you, by his grace, through nothing of your own work, through nothing of your own abilities, through nothing of your own value, that should drive you to a deeper place of worship. And so when you come to that deeper place of worship, you're then motivated to live out and do the things that Christ says you do as his followers. You are motivated to do the things that Christ has asked you to do throughout the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, excuse me, New Testament. So the importance of Passover and re the revelation that we see here in connection to Christ holds great significance for us as a New Testament church. And we have to understand that significance so that we understand what's about to happen in Mark because we're marching ever closer to the time when the true Lamb of God, the true Passover Lamb, will shed his blood for his people. So in conclusion, the Passover is set. The stage is ready for the true Lamb to fulfill his mission, to deliver his people from death and slavery to sin the slavery to a holy, sovereign God. And I pray that you're looking forward with eager anticipation as we march ever closer and see the grace that he gives in the next couple of weeks as we see the Passover and things like that implemented as a way of helping us remember who he is. So let's rest in the sovereignty of God and what Christ has done and will do as we'll see here in Mark very, very soon. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to come and see your sovereignty, your redemptive plan played out for us this morning. As you chose to reveal yourself at Passover for a very specific reason so that we could understand and have even more confidence in who you are and what you've done for your people. And Lord, from a, by your grace, a deeper place of worship and praise, I ask that you would help us to raise our voices and revel in all of you as the true Passover lamb, and that we'd rest in what you've done this coming week and trust in your sovereignty. In your holy name I pray. Amen.